Hey there, it's Jason from Codemanship with another video diary entry. Uh, before we begin, if you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe and ring the bell for notifications for new content. Okay, I wanted to talk today about um, the discipline of test-driven development, specifically this discipline of, of always writing the test first, not writing code that isn't needed to pass a test. Um, now, what often happens with people who are new to TDD or inexperienced with it um, is they, um, they kind of sort of intellectually understand this discipline, that this is what they're supposed to do, but they find it really, really hard not to write the solution code that they think they need to write, regardless of whether or not it's required for a test. And I just wanted to illustrate that with a simple example. So I've got a test here for um, code that calculates shipping costs for orders. Um, and we've got a bunch of um, business rules here. And we've got one example of an order that's going to be shipped standard delivery to an address in the UK. And the value of the order, the, the order total is under £30. Um, so I create an order with um, a single item of price £29.99. So it's under £30 and um, a quantity of one. So the order total is going to be under £30. Um, and we're saying that if we ship that to the UK standard delivery, the cost of that should be £3.95. If the order value is £30 or more, then it would be zero. It's free shipping. So we've got one test there. Now, this is what I see many, many people do when they first start with TDD. So they kind of understand what the rules are. And instead of saying, well, what's the simplest way of passing this test? They write a full implementation based on their understanding of the rules. Um, so they check to see what the order total is. Is it less than £30? They check to see where the destination is. Where is it going? They check to see what delivery method we're using. Is it standard delivery? And then they return um, that price, £3.95. Um, and of course, they have to calculate the total of the order uh, as well. And um, so they do a bunch of stuff to pass this single test. Um, and this is it's a subtle distinction here, um, because often when we talk about code that was not needed to pass a test, um, you can tell that by just, um, for example, running code coverage metrics to see if there's any code that's not being executed by test. That's a big giveaway, by the way, that you wrote code that you didn't need. So if I wrote run these tests and get a coverage report, we see in actual fact the coverage of the source code is 100%. Uh, it's 100%, which means all of the code is being executed by the test. So it is difficult to spot whether there's any redundant code. Now, one way that we could maybe get a better feel for which code was really needed is to use mutation testing. So the mutation testing often reveals more. So this basically changes the, the source code line by line. I'm going to use a tool called MutPy, I'm doing this in Python, and I'm going to tell it to mutate all the code in the source package. And I'll tell it where the unit tests are. They're in the test package, like that. And it's going to change, it's going to mutate the code one line at a time and run the test to see whether or not the test fails when we've broken the code. And there we've got a, a score of 85.7%. Um, so it's not 100%. There's, there's code in here that potentially isn't being tested. Let's just skip through and see if we can find, there's the one that survived. So this is the mutation that survived, that when it ran the test, all the test passed. Um, and what it did is it changed that less than 30 pounds there, so less than or equal to 30 pounds. And again, it's very subtle, but what we're kind of realizing as we look at this, hopefully, is that it's because we're, we've got untested branches. We're only testing essentially this path. Uh, there's a single path. And, and of course, there has to be a single path. Um, because there's only one test, there's only one scenario. So all of the code is being executed, but we're not actually testing the other side of this. What happens if the price is greater than or equal to 30? Um, and that kind of points to the fact that there, is, there are branches here that we don't actually need. In actual fact, I can probably get rid of all of that. And that means that we can get rid of that as well. And let's see if our test still passes, having got rid of all of that. Let's run it from here without a coverage report. OK, yeah, the test is still passing. So that suggests very strongly that we didn't need all of that code. Um, now, what happens here is that um, people quite naturally are thinking ahead. 
Um, and it's a good idea to think ahead so that we don't paint ourselves into a corner later. Um, but they're not just thinking ahead, they're coding ahead, as I call it. Um, so they're writing code that they think they're going to need. It's not needed to pass that test, but they think we're going to need this code, so I'll just write it now. And it's a very natural thing to do. And particularly when people are new to test-driven development, it's, it's, it's very hard to break that habit. It's very hard to get around that and work um, purely from the tests. What they should be doing, of course, is rather than writing extra branches, is they need to write more tests. So the clue is in the name. So we test standard delivery to K um, 30 pounds or more. So the discipline of test-driven development is disciplining yourself to always start with a test. So if you want the code to do something that it currently doesn't do, you don't just write that. You don't think well, we're going to need one of these. You go, well, we have to write a test for that. So we'll calculate shipping. So it's still UK, still standard delivery. Um, but this time the order total is going to be different. So let's create our order with an item that has a price of 30 pounds. So we're right on that boundary that was kind of hinted at by the, um, the mutation testing results. Um, so let's test that boundary, test at that boundary. So when I run um, this test, let's run them both, um, we see that test is failing because it should be returning zero when it's not. So now we need to do a check. What is the total of the items? So if so imagine we have a method for calculating the total. So if it's less than um, 30 pounds, as before, we'll do what we did before. We'll return a shipping cost of three pounds 95. Otherwise, return zero. And now we're gonna need some way of calculating total. Oops. So we can just, for example, Turn the sum of prices. So let's map the prices. Into a list. Okay, and then we rerun our tests. Now both tests are passing. So we only add the branch because we have a, a test case that requires that branch. We're looking at the other side of it. And then we would go on to write more tests about the destination. Is it in the UK? Is it not in the UK? The delivery method and so on and so forth. So we may indeed eventually end up with a logic that looks very similar to what was written before. But now, number one, we know that we need it. We know we need those branches. We know we have to do those checks. Uh, and two, everything's being tested. Um, for example, if I now run my mutation testing again, so not that pi, actually we can just speed things up a little by reusing what I did before. Okay, so now none of the mutants survive because we're covering all of our bases, so to speak. So as a natural consequence, we don't end up with code that we didn't need. That's very important. Um, but also, we don't end up with code that's not really being tested. So your mutation coverage tends to be very high um, if you're very disciplined about TDD. And that's a big giveaway when it isn't. Um, but an even bigger giveaway, of course, is if your actual code coverage is, is, is patchy. If there's parts of the code that are not tested, then you very probably didn't write. Well, you certainly didn't write a test for that code first. Um, so that is the discipline of test-driven development. And it, is a, it is a difficult discipline to build. It takes a lot of practice. And especially when they're new to TDD, a lot of developers don't realize they're doing it. We're so used to think, thinking, well, I need one of these, so I'll just write one. Um, we don't stop ourselves and go, hang on a minute, do I need that yet? Or should I write a test for that first? And this is where pair programming and ensemble programming can really help. If there's someone there sort of watching and keeping an eye on the, the discipline of TDD. So saying, hang on a minute, should we write a test for this first? Do we really need that line of code and so on and so forth? Um, that can really, really help, particularly in the um, in those early stages when you're learning TDD, to have someone by your side. Now, if you don't have that luxury, 
Um, one thing that I found really helps is if you do exercises in test-driven development, um, record yourself, record a little uh, screen um, video of you doing TDD um, and watch it back. Very often people don't realize that they're doing things when they're doing them. So watch it back and just sort of, you know, keep an eye on, oh, I didn't really need that yet. Oh, I should have written a test for that first. or oh, I forgot to run the tests and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a big part of the discipline of test-driven development is always test first. We're only writing code to pass tests um, and it takes some getting used to. Anyway, that's my video diary entry for today. I hope you're keeping well. Um, uh, see you in the next one.